This is Charlie from the World Sports Show. I'm with Joe Lloyd, and we're going to be talking about a speech you're going to be giving on November the 20th. They're going to be giving a couple different speeches about you know, domestic violence, and so I'm addressing kids. I think that's kind of a unique thing when you're addressing young players about this issue. Yeah, so uh, we're going to be having some Every Voice Count speeches at the Keeper Institute. Uh, it's an indoor training center for goalkeepers, but we're going to hopefully pack that place out with young kids and you know, the message is uh, motivated because I lost my sister to domestic violence. However, the message really is just encouraging young uh, young people, young girls, young boys about their self-worth and uh, to gain uh, more self-esteem and, and better confidence and of just a better image of who they are. Because um, I believe if they view themselves um, highly, they'll treat other people uh, highly as well. And, you know, as going with the older kid it's really educating them on signs of domestic violence and empowering women that they're important and they don't need um, someone in their life that needs to show them affirmation that they just already have a deep strong conviction in who they are and that they're loved and special and important independent of their performance or what other people have to say about them. Yeah, it's definitely a positive thing. You've been doing this, you know, for a couple of years now. You know, it's 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 very sad the way you lost your sister, but you know, you're moving forward. You know, it, it's inspired a lot of people, and just you know, the connections it's made. I mean, what what has that done for you as a person? Um, it's completely transformed my life. I mean, um, you know, I was still playing soccer when this all started, and have since retired, and really dedicated my life to encouraging people, uh, empowering people. Um, whether it was, it's through the Keeper Institute or it's through the foundation, um, and to hear people's stories um, of strength and to hear people's stories of courage in the face of adversity, uh, whether it's having left a situation from domestic violence or having um, dealt with it from their parents, it's just so encouraging to me um, that I need to keep doing what I'm doing and, and keep telling my sister's story and allow her story to help change people's lives and and save lives. Um, I think that's the coolest thing is when someone comes to me and they say, hey, Jill, thank you so much for sharing that story because um, it's really encouraged me to leave a situation that I knew I shouldn't have been in. And I, I, I think it saved my life. And I mean, I think that's the most rewarding thing that I could ever do. Yeah, we've talked about this before about a lot of, you know, the situation now or are trying to get in that preventive measures of trying to get people out of these relationships, out of these situations, and try to look for the signs before they happen. Yeah, I, you know, I remember sitting in high school and in college and, and having no idea about domestic violence. Um, I never, those two words never were put together for me when I was younger. And so uh, because of that, I didn't know any warning signs. And um, now that I'm educated, I wish, I wish, I wish I would have known more of the signs when I was younger because I would have been able to help my sister um, before it got too, too out of hand. Um, so really just sharing um, some cues and, and different um, warning signs in relationships with young females is super important because if they're aware, if they're educated, then they can recognize it and nip it in the butt before it gets it too out of hand. Another big thing, too, you probably come up with when, when young athletes and young women, even young men, come to you and, and say it's a lot of that is they, they start the, that, that blame of themselves type thing. I hear that a lot with people, that, that the people that are victims of domestic violence, sometimes they put the blame on themselves saying they're, they're the ones that cause the situation. But a lot of it, I mean, it's getting that empowerment to women. Sure. I mean, the, domestic violence is a control issue, um, you know, whether it's a man or woman the abuser controls their victim and the abuser manipulates their victim into thinking that they deserve it, that it's their fault, that the, the abuser is the only one that could ever love the victim. Um, and it's just, it's over time. It's a long, long period of time of brainwashing. And then the victim feels like I deserve this. I'm really not worthy of love um, from anyone. And this person is the only one that could love me. So I, and forced to stay in these situations or even down the line, you know, when there's children involved and women think, you know, that they have to be strong and by being strong, they need to stay in that relationship, which that's not the truth at all. Yeah. And you see that situation where they, they start defending the person that's being the abuser. Yeah. Oftentimes it happens and, um, you know, the cops will be called and then the, the uh, victim will say, no, 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 uh, nothing happens, not the charges. And, it's just a cycle, and it will continue to happen unless 
you know, both parties uh, decide that they need to get help and they need counseling and both parties seek uh, outside um, counsel. And there's, there's things about the law that probably frustrate you and me that a lot of these domestic violence things that when it's like an assault of a personal crime that if a person drops charges then sometimes the whole thing is just dropped and it's kind of erased from their record. You see plenty of these athletes with a profile athletes, they if the person doesn't press charges, they just they erase it from their record. And to me, that's it. to me, it's a crime is committed, whether a person press charges or not. That's still a crime. Yeah, it's it's a really um, touchy subject now these days, especially with athletes. I mean, the Greg Hardy situation that just occurred in the NFL, and it's a hot topic. But I think that um, because it's in the media and because it's in the eye and in sports, that people are starting to talk about it more, which is really encouraging. Um, when I was growing up. You know, whatever happened in your uh, neighbor's house, it was their business and you didn't get involved. And so um, now that more people are starting to become aware that this is a problem, um, the conversation is starting. And now I think more people are educating themselves and um, being able to stand up for their own rights. Yeah, I think it's it's just me on a personal level. I, I think that it's, you know, signing these types of players. I believe, yeah, and sometimes in life you give a second chance, but you're, you're bringing on a person who needs a lot of mental help and counseling not just a suspension from a league. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what the NFL rules are, but I think that, you know, any person who gets in trouble for domestic violence, it should be mandated that they get some sort of help um, and show some active contrition to repent for what they've done and, you know, move forward. Now you'll be holding this, you know, like I said, November the 20th, it's at the Keeper Institute headquarters. You know, you're doing a speech at six to seven with some of the younger children, then seven to eight with the older you know, what, what's, you know, some of the things that, you know, that you've, you know, can tell young kids, because it, it is a touchy, touchy subject for, for young kids, you know, what sure. going through and some that can't make it some advice you could give them for this interview. Well, um, for young kids, it, the message is completely different. Um, I talk about being a superhero and I talk about treating people the right way and I talk about bullying and it's just basically, um, letting them know that their voice is important and being able to communicate um, whatever they feel with someone who can help them, whether it's a teacher or a parent or friend or whatever that might be, but also letting them know that um, they have the right to act however they want, but it's really empowering them to act the right way and treat people the right way and say the right things um, that are uplifting and they're not tearing people down and they're not looking for differences in, within people, but looking for similarities and just encouraging them to know that they're important and that, that they should be strong, confident women and that they have a hope. I mean, I was in their shoes when I was a little kid and, you know, not confident, not sure. And being able to share a little bit about my soccer story really encourages them and motivates them. So it's a, it's a, it's going to be a fun time. Um, it's not just about domestic violence. It's how we treat each other. It's, you know, confidence, self-esteem. And I think that if whoever comes, when they leave those doors, they're going to leave a different person, um, more encouraged, more inspired, um, more loved, more confident um, just to tackle everyday life. I mean, these are all the things that, that coaches, you know, should be telling in general. I think it goes hand in hand with coaching is it's developing that mental aspect of a player is spending that time just doing that chalk talk and just, talking to players, getting to know them, just those life lessons. Yeah, I mean, I think great coaches, um, you know, don't spend a lot of time motivating kids, but they spend a lot of time motivating kids so that they can then motivate themselves. I mean, as a coach, you see kids maybe four hours a week, and they're off at their homes by themselves all week. So it's really um, the job to, of a coach to motivate kids, to motivate themselves to go out and do the work and, you know, be confident and to try things and give them that freedom. So, now you've gone to that transition that you from you know the national team. You're tired from playing pro ball, but you know you've got a lot of life to live. So that retired term is kind of a a funny term to throw around. You know, what what are you taking from that period now? Are you being more the coach and teacher? Um, I I feel like I I loved always loved playing and you know it was a great time in my life. But I I feel that I am more of a teacher and I am more of a coach and. I, I really think that this is my avenue for, for a long time. And uh, I just love in, encouraging kids. I am a gifted professional exhorter and encourager um, with my words. And so I know that, um, that kids need that in their lives. And there's so many things that try to take um, everybody's confidence and they try to steal 
their self-worth. And so being able to empower kids to do uh, greater things than I've ever done is some of the best and most rewarding work I could ever do. I'm sure that thrill, I get that same thrill when, when you when you coach and you, you see that on a field and just that, that joy that probably brings you. Yeah, it's, it's a joy, you know, when they succeed uh, on the field, but it's even better when they come back and they're just really great people. And I think um, that's like one of the things that we've really tried to cultivate at the Keeper Institute is family. I mean, last week we went to um, one of our students' college games for their conference final, and there was about 10 of our goalkeepers there, and they were supporting and yelling and cheering, and it was just awesome. It's just it's a, a real family, and everybody really cares about each other. And I think that's what I love about sports so much. Yeah, I think it's neat. I've come out. I came out to one of the viewing parties this past summer, and it's neat seeing different keepers from different walks of life but you know you all share that common bond of of soccer goalkeeping and just it becomes a family atmosphere yeah it's so much so that some kids are like I don't want to go to my real training I just want to come to goalkeeper training (laughs) because they feel like they're you know they're not alone at like you know their club trainings where it's a family of goalkeepers and everybody understands what everybody's going through and you know if you make a mistake you have somebody there who's picking you up or someone there who's pushing you um to be be the best that you can so it's a fun atmosphere i love it no i I love what you're doing there i do the goalkeeping coach like i've told you and and people know that that a lot of times goalkeeper kind of kind of thrown into two presses and and misused so i mean doing this just helps them you know when they're not getting that proper training at their clubs yeah yeah it's you know and even when kids are getting the training it's great for them to just come and and learn about the mental side of the game and learn the tactics and learn how to to uh, organize set plays and learn how to lead. Um, that's the biggest thing that we try to teach at the Keeper Institute is being great leaders. And whether you're a captain or not, if you're a goalkeeper, the word goalkeeper is synonymous with leader. And whether you're leading the whole team or just yourself in the right manner, um, I think that that is one of the most important things that we can impart on these young kids. I'm sure you might have run across this. I've gotten a few kids in camps that are not goalkeepers, but they, they've come and said, hey, I want to learn this position. I might never play it, but I want to learn it so I can understand it better. Yeah, mm-hmm. a, lot of, a lot of kids. And I think at the younger age that kids should probably just play in goal, um, you know, once every couple of weeks just because you just never know what kind of um, – who's going to fall in love with it. And that's kind of how I got started. The coach was like, you're the tallest kid. Just get in there and see what, <laughs> what you could do. And uh, I, I remember it was my second game, and I never left you after that. There you go. So you did play. Where did you play? I say you you didn't get thrown in goal. Where would you have seen you on the on the field? Oh, striker, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think every goalkeeper thinks that they're a striker. Well, that's a lot. A lot of people don't know goalkeepers are actually deep shot because of a lot of practice and a lot of shooting, a lot of volleying that we become pretty good shooters. Yeah, and we have to read all the, what the fours are doing so we know how what to do or what we should be doing or how to be the keeper. Yeah. Well, Jill, th- thank you for joining me it's this next Friday, November the 20th, 6 to 8 p.m. Okay, at Institute. That's at 11 Enterprise in Sweel, New Jersey. So I want to thank you for joining me. See you there. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you, Joe. Bye-bye.